Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on angiogenesis. In this video, what we're going to talk about is hypoxia-inducible factor. Okay, so we're going to talk about how uh, cells which are hypoxic uh, turn on uh, the means to um, activate angiogenesis and also increase expression of anaerobic um, respiration enzymes. Okay, so hypoxia inducible factor. Okay, so this is a very important player in a cell's response to hypoxia, basically. Right, so we'll start off by discussing the structure of hypoxia inducible factor 1, and we'll then talk about how uh, in hypoxic conditions hypoxia inducible factor 1 will be activated. Okay, so uh, let's start off then. The hypoxia-inducible factor that we're going to talk about is hypoxia-inducible factor 1. It's the main one, okay? And for short, hypoxia-inducible factor is denoted HIF for short. Uh, so, um, if someone talks about hypoxia-inducible factor without clarifying the number afterwards, you can assume they're talking about hypoxia-inducible factor 1. Okay, right. So it's actually a heterodimer. It's made up of two separate proteins dimerized together. So let me show this here. So there are two proteins to hypoxia-inducible factor 1 that are joined together. And one is hypoxia-inducible factor 1-alpha. Okay, so HIF 1-alpha, hypoxia-inducible factor 1-alpha. And the other is hypoxia-inducible factor 1 beta, HIF 1 beta. So let me colour these two in separate colours. So this is the structure of the hypoxia inducible factor 1. So it's this dimer of two different types of protein. Okay, now, uh, you don't usually, under normoxia conditions, so a normal oxygen level, and I'll put that fancy word, so under normoxic conditions, uh, you don't usually have um, hypoxia-inducible factor 1 uh, dimers existing. So this doesn't usually exist in cells which are exposed to normal levels of oxygen. Now, why is that? Well, basically, it's not the fault of the hypoxia-inducible factor 1 beta. So in all cells in your body that are under normal oxygen conditions, you will have high levels of hypoxia hypoxia-inducible factor 1 beta. So it's constitutively expressed, basically. You have lots of it within your cells, and it doesn't really change depending on the level of oxygen. So what changes is how much hypoxia-inducible factor 1 alpha you have within the cytoplasm of the cell. So under normoxic conditions, you usually have very low levels of hypoxia-inducible factor 1 alpha. Now, this is not because you do not create hypoxia-inducible factor 1 alpha. In fact, under normoxic conditions, you are creating the same amount of hypoxia-inducible factor 1 alpha as you create under hypoxic conditions. So the synthesis is absolutely fine. The problem is that the moment that the hypoxia-inducible factor 1 alpha is made, it's going to be destroyed. Okay, so let me now explain the pathway by which it gets uh, destroyed. So, basically, in order to understand this, we need to know about a certain domain that the hypoxia-inducible factor 1-alpha has within it. So let's say this is our hypoxia-inducible factor 1-alpha protein. There is a special domain within this protein known as the uh, oxygen-dependent degradation domain. So let's say that this is the oxygen dependent degradation domain. So basically, this uh, degradation of this um, hypoxia-inducible factor 1 alpha is dependent upon the presence of oxygen. So you only destroy the hypoxia-inducible factor 1 alpha if uh, there is um, oxygen present. And when there's no oxygen present, i.e. in hypoxia, you won't destroy the hypoxia-inducible factor 1-alpha. Uh, okay, and that's how uh, you initiate a response to um, how you initiate a response to um, hypoxia. Okay, and it should be oxygen-dependent with the dash there, uh, rather uh, than between the dependent and the degradation. So oxygen-dependent degradation 
and I'm spelling this wrong. Degradation. That why has that got an I in there? Degradation. And then it's the domain. So the oxygen dependent degradation domain. And for short, the oxygen dependent degradation domain is known as the ODD domain. Okay, so O for oxygen, D for dependent, and then D for degradation. So the ODD domain. So this special domain here has two proteins in which are going to be uh, hydroxylated under conditions of normoxia. So when oxygen is present, you will destroy the hypoxia-inducible factor 1-alpha. When it's not present, you won't destroy it, and that's how we're going to respond and detect uh, the hypoxia. Okay, so basically, in this oxygen-dependent degradation domain, there are two proline um, residues which are going to be hydroxylated. Uh, and this is going to lead to the uh, destruction of this hypoxia-inducible factor 1-alpha. So basically, you have a proline residue at position 402, and you also have a proline residue at position 564. Okay, so what that means is if you imagine that this hypoxia-inducible factor 1-alpha, even though we've imagined it folded up, it is fundamentally a polypeptide. It's a polymer of amino acids. So you can count the amino acids. So you can start with the first one, the second one. You can count all the way up to the 402th one. And then you can go onwards to the 564th one. If you look at the 402th one and the 564th one, they will both be prolines, basically. So you'll find a proline here and another proline here. And these proteins are going to be hydroxylated. Okay, and I'm going to explain the process of hydroxylating proteins. Okay, now you might have heard of something similar to this before, and in fact, you will have heard of something, well, you might have heard of something very similar to this before, uh, which is uh, that collagen, a very important protein uh, in connective tissue, collagen has hydroxylated prolines, and basically uh, the modification is the same uh, as is in collagen, basically. We're going to put on a 4-hydroxyl group. Okay, so let me show you the structure of a normal proline residue, and then I'll show you how we're going to hydroxylate it. And then we'll discuss the enzymes which are going to hydroxylate it, and we'll discuss how this process is going to be oxygen-dependent. Okay, so we'll start off with the structure of a proline residue. So here's the amino group, here's the alpha carbon, here's the carboxylic acid group, and we're drawing a proline residue, so we're imagining that this is within a protein, basically. Okay, so the amino group and the carboxylic acid group will be bound to amino groups and carboxylic acid groups of other amino acids by peptide links. And off the alpha carbon, you have a hydrogen, and then the R group in proline is basically this ring structure, like so. Okay, a five-membered ring structure. And off these carbons, you then have hydrogens coming off. Okay, like so. Right, uh, so this is the structure of proline. This is a normal proline residue. And basically, what we're going to do is we're going to take one of these hydrogens off this carbon and put on an alcohol group instead. So we're going to convert it to what is called 4-hydroxyproline. And I'll discuss the reaction that you actually use uh, to do this in a moment. Okay, so 4-hydroxyproline will have an alcohol group coming off this fourth carbon because this carbon with the carboxylic acid group on, that's considered the first carbon, then the alpha carbon is the second carbon, third, fourth. Okay, so we're going to add an alcohol group onto this middle member of the ring, basically. So let's draw out the structure again. So here's the amino group. Here's the alpha carbon. Let me just move this up a little bit. Okay, uh, here's the carboxylic acid group, which will be linked with the amino group of the next amino acid along. And then we've got this five-membered ring here, like so. And then we've got an alcohol group now coming off this um, f uh, fourth carbon here, and one hydrogen also. And then two hydrogens off this carbon, and then also two hydrogens still off this carbon. 
So this is the structure of 4-hydroxyproline, and this is what's going to happen to the proline at position 402 and the proline at position 564 in the oxygen-dependent degradation domain of the hypoxia-inducible factor 1-alpha. Okay, and this is normally happening uh, in a normoxic cell uh, where there are normal oxygen levels. This is happening, and this hydroxylation of the proline residues is going to lead to the degradation of the hypoxia-inducible factor 1-alpha. So, how does this reaction work? Well, basically, uh, you also need, as a, um, a, a co-reagent, uh, you also need 2-oxoglutaric acid. Uh, which is also called alpha-ketoglutaric acid, uh, and it's a member of the Krebs cycle, basically. So, 2-oxoglutaric acid. So, glutaric acid, okay, is the name for a uh, carboxylic acid where you have five carbons and carboxylic acid groups at each end of the molecule, basically. So, let me show you the structure of this. Okay, so, here is a carboxylic acid group. And then we need five carbons in total. So here's the second one, the third one, the fourth one, the fifth one. And then we need a carboxylic acid group off here. Now, if we just wanted glutaric acid, then we just put hydrogens off all of these three carbons now to saturate them. Okay, so it would just be a five carbon molecule with two carboxylic acid groups at either end. But we want two oxoglutaric acid. So we'll pick this as our second carbon rather than this one over here and we'll put a double bond to an oxygen atom like that okay and then we'll saturate the other two with hydrogens so this is then is the structure of two oxoglutaric acid okay right uh, so you're also going to need an oxygen molecule so i'll put an oxygen molecule here so these are the three things on this side of the equation and now what's going to happen is you're going to get the 4-hydroxyproline. You're also going to get a molecule of succinic acid. Okay, so let me now show you the structure of succinic acid. So succinic acid is the name for 4-carbon molecule where you have carboxylic acid groups at either end. So here is a carboxylic acid group. Then we need two carbons in the middle. And then another carboxylic acid group down here. So this is succinic acid. Okay. And the difference between succinic acid and succinate is the same as the difference between glutaric acid and glutarate. Basically, the ates, the succinate and the glutarate, those are the conjugate bases of the succinic acid and the glutaric acid. So if you lose the protons from these oxygens, which of course you will, um, because these are acid groups, uh, then that, the structure you end up with is then called succinate, basically. It's the conjugate base. Okay, right. And the other um, product that you get is a molecule of carbon dioxide. So we're not going to look at the, um, the mechanism of this reaction. What we will just do is make sure that it makes sense, i.e. that what we have on this side adds up to what we have on this side. Okay, so, basically... Uh, what you can think of doing is if we're going to convert uh, two oxoglutaric acid into succinic acid, you can imagine taking out uh, this carbonyl group here and then binding this carbon to this carbon. Okay, so imagine, although this is absolutely not the mechanism by which this occurs, okay, imagine, just to make sense of this reaction, imagine taking that bit out, okay. Uh, so break these two bonds and give one of the electrons from this carbon back to this carbon, one of the electrons from this carbon, sorry, one of the electrons from this bond back to this carbon and the other back to this carbon, and do the same for this bond. Give this carbon one electron and give this carbon one electron. Then bind this carbon of this carboxylic acid group to this carbon here. That will create us the succinic acid, although this is not the way it happens. In reality, this carboxylic acid group is going to create the carbon dioxide, and this oxygen here will create the new alcohol group on there as well as the new alcohol group on here. But just to make sense of the reaction, Okay, so we've got our succinic acid. Then we've got this carbon doubly bound to oxygen. We can then take one of the oxygens off here. So break this double bond here. Okay, 
give two electrons back to this oxygen and two back to this other oxygen, then bind one of this, these oxygens to this carbon, uh, which also has two free electrons to create carbon dioxide, then uh, bind this oxygen. Uh, well, actually, first you're going to have to cut off one of these hydrogens. Um, I've cut the wrong one, damn it, but never mind. Um, cut one of these bonds here between the carbon and the hydrogen, give one electron back to each of the two members of the bond, and then bring in the oxygen atom, which has two free electrons, and bind it both to the carbon, and then the hydrogen can bind to the other, oxygen, the other free electron of the oxygen. Okay, and that's how this reaction makes sense, basically. The things on that side add up to the things on this side. Okay, right, so this is the hydroxylation of proline residues. In the next video, what we'll do is discuss uh, the enzymes which catalyze this reaction, and um, we'll also discuss uh, what happens under hypoxic conditions.